Every culture, no matter how big or small, contributes to the larger global community. My name is Ryan, and on this channel, I research and share not only where a country is, its history and government, but also the people, products, and ideas they've had to help shape the lives of people around the world. Today, we learn about Scotland, a country of 5 million people. There are an estimated 30 to 40 million people with Scottish ancestry living in the world today meaning that there are six to eight times more people of Scottish descent living outside of its borders than there are in the country itself. As you're about to see, the people of Scotland's impact on the world is immense. Keep watching to learn about Scotland and all that it has given to the global community. What did you find interesting about it and what did I miss? Please share your thoughts in the comments below. If you want to learn more about our global community, don't forget to subscribe. Watch my face. Stop my Scotland is in Western Europe and makes up the northern one-third of the island of Great Britain. As a member of the United Kingdom, Scotland can be considered a country within a country, and we'll answer how that's even possible in the government and economy section later in the video. The capital of Scotland is Edinburgh, and if you don't want to get on the wrong side of a Scot, make sure to pronounce it correctly. The Scots take great pride in their capital, and they don't like it when foreigners pronounce it Edinburgh. Seriously, it's a thing. The total area of Scotland is 30,414 square miles which makes it slightly larger than the state of South Carolina, and the landscape is as diverse as it is beautiful. Scotland, with its 790 islands, is broken into three regions. Most people in Scotland live in a region known as the Central Belt, an area near the middle that has the two largest cities in Scotland, Edinburgh and Glasgow. One of my biggest regrets in life is passing on the opportunity to study abroad at the University of Edinburgh for a semester. Yup, that was a mistake. To its south is the Southern Uplands, the least populated part of Scotland. The most most rural and agricultural of the regions, it is known for its ranges of hills and mountains. The southern uplands, and especially those areas next to the English border, have a troubled and bloody history. Due to being so close to their long-term frenemies, England, the southern uplands experienced raids from their southern neighbors for centuries. And honestly, the raids went both ways. While sparsely populated, the Highlands might be the most iconic area of Scotland. Known for its amazing scenery, the Highland Games, and for producing one of Scotland's more famous exports, Scotch whiskey. Anciently known Known as the water of life, Scotch whiskey must be made according to law. A type of drink known worldwide, the Scotch Whiskey Association estimates that Scotland's whiskey industry supports 40,000 jobs and accounts for over $4 billion in exports every year. So grab a single malt and join us as we discover what else comes from Scotland. A book by the name of The Wealth of Nations, written by Scotsman Adam Smith, ushered in modern economics. Smith identified land, labor, and capital as the three factors of production and the major contributors to a nation's wealth. Known as the Bible of Capitalism, Adam Smith's ideas basically ushered out mercantilism, the old favorite economic system of the Europeans, and replaced it with the capitalist free market ideas better suited to a world that in the late 18th century was becoming more industrialized by the minute. Many of Adam Smith's ideas on capitalism are still used throughout much of the world today. Speaking of disposing of old smelly things like mercantilism, the flushing toilet was improved upon by Scottish inventor Alexander Cumming in 1775. He improved the flushing mechanisms from previous toilets and invented the S-trap, which kept water in the pipes at all times, taking away the foul smells that we don't want traveling through our home. In 1928, Scotsman Alexander Fleming discovered the first effective antibiotic and named it penicillin. In what has been described as the single greatest victory ever achieved over disease, it's given to patients with an infection caused by bacteria. Penicillin can fight bacterial infections such as pneumonia, strep throat, meningitis, and even a dental infection. One thing that penicillin can't cure is the unfortunate sight of seeing someone in a Speedo that shouldn't be. The Speedo, the uh, tiny fitting bathing suit, was founded in Australia by a Scottish emigrant, Alexander McRae. I'm not going to get to all of the Scottish inventions, folks. Let me know which Scottish inventions you would have liked to have seen in the comments below. One invention I can't leave out is the bicycle. Originally invented in Germany, the first bicycles didn't have pedals. Kirkpatrick McMillan changed that and created the first two-wheeled, pedal-powered bicycle in 1839. Unfortunately, he did not invent brakes on a bicycle because McMillan was also credited with the first reported bicycling traffic offense three years later when he was fined five shillings for knocking over a little girl while taking a bike ride in Glasgow. Other massive inventions by the Scottish include the refrigerator, criminal fingerprinting, the toaster, and modern geology. 
And of course, the Scottish are credited with the creation of modern day golf. While its ancient origins involve a debate I don't want to get involved in, the modern game of golf originated in 15th century Scotland, where the first written record of golf is James II's banning of the game in 1457 as an unwelcome distraction to learning archery. James IV lifted the ban in 1502 when he became a golfer himself, with golf clubs recorded soon after. Scotland was founded in 843 and much of their early history involves fighting with their neighbors to the south, England. Its relationship soured in the 11th century when raids on northern England prompted William the Conqueror to invade Scotland and forced King Malcolm III to submit to his authority. That proclamation opened up Scotland to later claims of sovereignty by English kings such as Edward the Longshanks. The Wars of Scottish Independence happened in part because King Alexander III of Scotland died in 1286, leaving his three-year-old granddaughter Margaret, maid of Norway, as his heir. Margaret died on the voyage to Scotland, leaving 13 people vying for the Scottish throne. The Guardians of Scotland asked Edward I to come north to arbitrate so that Scotland would not fall into a civil war, and travel north he did. But he forced the Scottish to recognize him as Lord Paramount of Scotland, which effectively dampened the mood. The ensuing years led to the First War of Scottish Independence in 1296. The war began with Edward the Longshanks' brutal sacking of Berwick, followed by a Scottish loss at the Battle of Dunbar and the abdication of John Balliol in July. At this point, Scotland was all but conquered. Things started to turn around when William Wallace, Braveheart, and other nobles began to fight back. We'll take a closer look at William Wallace in the next section of the video. Robert the Bruce became King of the Scots in 1306 and pushed the English back to their border. A pivotal event was the Battle of Bannockburn, which effectively kicked England out of Scotland. Upon finding out that the English had low morale, Robert launched a full-scale attack on the English forces who were able to be defeated in the battle and resulted in the deaths or capture of many prominent commanders. The victory against the English at Bannockburn in 1314 is the most celebrated in Scottish history, and for centuries the battle has been commemorated in verse and art. The fighting did not end until 1357, resulting in continued Scottish independence. During the Scottish Enlightenment and Industrial Revolution, Scotland became one of the commercial, intellectual, and industrial powers of Europe. The thinkers of the Scottish Enlightenment asserted the importance of human reason combined with a rejection of any authority that could not be justified by reason. Among the fields that rapidly advanced during the Scottish Enlightenment included philosophy, political economy, medicine, botany, law, agriculture, chemistry, and sociology. Some prominent Enlightenment thinkers included Francis Hutcheson, best known for his book A System of Moral Philosophy, David Hume, who is best known today for his highly influential system of philosophical skepticism and naturalism. He explored the nature of man in his book A Treatise of Human Nature, and the aforementioned Adam Smith, who created capitalism. The Jacobites were supporters of the exiled royal house of Stuart and the Catholic King James II who had lost his throne during the Glorious Revolution in 1688. Hard feelings lingered and in 1743 war broke out between England and France, a Catholic nation that had always supported the Stuarts' claim to the English throne. King Louis XV informed the Stuarts in 1745 that if they invaded England he would supply them with arms and ammunition. James was not interested, but his son Charles Stuart, later known as Bonnie Prince Charlie, was. Once in Scotland, Charles Stuart began building up his army, recruiting many Catholics from the Highlands. After some early victories, things started to turn as he was unable to recruit English Catholics to the cause. To make matters worse, Louis XV did not follow through with his promise to supply 12,000 soldiers, forcing the Jacobites back to Scotland. After months of being chased around Scotland, Charles Stuart decided to turn and fight the English army. The two forces met at Culloden Moor, with Cumberland's army destroying the Jacobite army. To punish those who supported Charles, many were executed and their land was given to those who would remain loyal to George II. Scotsmen were also banned from wearing kilts and playing bagpipes. William Wallace of Braveheart fame is a Scottish hero. I have to admit, Braveheart is one of my favorite movies of all time, and while it isn't the most historically accurate movie, it's a great movie to check out. It'll make you appreciate all things Scottish. William Wallace may not have had an affair with the princes of France, he likely didn't paint his face with woad, and the types of kilt he wore had not been invented yet, but along with Andrew Murray, Wallace did defeat an English army at the Battle of Stirling Bridge in September of 1297. 
He was appointed Guardian of Scotland and served until his defeat at the Battle of Falkirk in July of 1298. In August 1305, Wallace was captured near Glasgow. He was handed over to King Edward the Longshanks of England, who had him hanged, drawn and quartered for high treason, and crimes against the English civilians. Since his death, Wallace has obtained an iconic status far beyond his homeland. Alexander Graham Bell was born in and spent his childhood in Scotland. He is credited with inventing and patenting the first practical telephone. He also co-founded the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, in other words, AT&T, in 1885. We have to also mention Sir Sean Connery, most famous for being the greatest James Bond of all time, and author Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes. There are so many other people I could have mentioned. Who do you think I should have shared? The answer is not elementary, my dear Watson. The most popular Scottish food in their national dish is haggis, a Scottish pudding that has minced sheep's heart, liver, and lungs. It also has onions, oatmeal, suet, spices, and salt mixed with stock and simmered for approximately three hours. Most modern commercial haggis is prepared in a sausage casing rather than an actual stomach lining like it had been in the past. And while some of the ingredients may turn your stomach, consider what Americans put in hot dogs. Seriously, look it up. Oatcakes have been a mainstay of Scottish breads for centuries. An oatcake is a type of flatbread similar to a cracker, biscuit, or a type of pancake, depending on where you get it or how it's made. They are prepared with oatmeal as the main ingredient and sometimes include plain or wholemeal flour. I became aware of oatcakes, though I've yet to taste one, due to the prominence it has in the region of my favorite football team, Stoke City. I'm sure I'll get hate for this as Stoke is not the most popular team in Europe. Who do you support? Leave me a message in the comments telling me who you follow. A type of food many likely don't realize is from Scotland is chicken tikka masala, a dish that has roasted marinated chicken chunks and spiced curry sauce. Though it is considered Indian cuisine, it is believed it was invented in a restaurant in Glasgow. When British Bangladeshi chef Ali Ahmed Aslam, owner of the Shish Mahal restaurant in Glasgow, invented chicken tikka masala by improvising a sauce made from yogurt, cream, and spices to please a hungry bus driver. As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, Scotland is a country within a country. The Acts of Union was signed between England and Scotland in 1707. Because of the Acts, the two countries were separate legislatures but the same monarch united into one kingdom by the name of Great Britain. The United Kingdom, as it's now called, is a sovereign state that consists of the four individual countries, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And while the United Kingdom Parliament is sovereign, each country has autonomy to some extent. For the most part, country parliaments defer to the United Kingdom Parliament in reserved matters that deal with things like foreign policy and EU membership, but keeps authority over devolved matters that deal with things like education and housing. Though bound to the crown and tied together in union, the individual countries within the United Kingdom keep their own local identities. This separate identity allows Scotland to have its own football league, among other things. Scotland also has representation in the United Kingdom Parliament, with Scotsman Tony Blair and Gordon Brown as recent examples of Scottish men becoming Prime Minister. The Scottish Parliament building is in the Holy Rod area of Edinburgh. Scotland remains a small but open economy and accounts for about 5% of the United Kingdom's export revenue. Its gross domestic product per capita is higher than in all other areas of the United Kingdom outside of London and England's eastern regions, and its level of unemployment is pretty low. Scotland was one of the industrial powerhouses of Europe from the time of the Industrial Revolution onwards, being a world leader in manufacturing. Scotland's primary industries include agriculture and forestry, fishing and oil due to oil reserves being found in Scottish waters in the North Sea. Scottish involvement in the United States is enormous and a bit confusing due to there being two large and somewhat separate groups living in the United States. There are an estimated 20 to 25 million Americans today with Scottish ancestry and an additional 27 to 30 million more that can be identified as Scots-Irish. While those identifying as Scots-American are descended from those who immigrated directly from Scotland, the Scots-Irish are descendants of Ulster Protestants who immigrated from Northern Ireland to America during the 18th and 19th centuries, whose ancestors had originally migrated mainly from the Scottish lowlands in Northern England. Whatever the designation, many Scots began to move to America after the Jacobite Uprising of 1745. How deep do Scottish roots grow in America? 
The first successful English colony in North America, Jamestown, was even named after King James VI, a Scotsman. Early Americans with Scottish ancestry include Alexander Hamilton, John Muir, John Paul Jones, the father of the American Navy, and early presidents James Monroe and Andrew Jackson. You could probably make a whole YouTube channel on the Scottish impact on the United States of America, but here are a few things I can't leave out. Uncle Sam, the face of the American government, was in fact based off of a real person, Scottish-American Samuel Wilson. Many scholars believe that the term hillbilly originated from Scottish dialect, and many living in the Appalachians that first got the nickname were of Scottish descent. The term hill folk referred to people who preferred isolation from the greater society, and Billy meant comrade or companion. American bluegrass and country music styles have some of their roots in the Appalachian ballad culture of the Scots-Irish Americans, mostly from the border ballad tradition of southern Scotland and northern England. As for Americans with Scottish ancestry, it is believed that as many as 75% of the American presidents have been at least partly Scottish. Most recently, Donald Trump, whose mother was from Scotland, and Barack Obama, whose mother was part Scottish. Other notable Scottish Americans include the leader of the American steel industry, Andrew Carnegie, co-founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates, the first man in space, Alan Shepard, the first American to orbit the Earth, John Glenn, the first men on the moon, John Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. The Davidson brothers, the Davidson founders of the motorcycle company, Harley Davidson. And frontiersman, Sam Houston. Who should have I added? Please let me know in the comments. One of the most famous mythical creatures in the world is Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster. Believed to be living in the second largest lake in Scotland, Loch Ness, there's been a lot of popular interest and belief in the creature since it was brought to worldwide attention in 1933, though there have been reports of it since 565. Several pictures have surfaced over the years, but its existence is still debated. Real or not, Nessie does wonders for the Scottish economy. She contributes nearly $40 million annually to Scotland's economy by the way of monster merchandise and tours for fans. An animal many still can't believe is real but is would be Dolly the Sheep, who was the first mammal cloned from an adult somatic cell using the process of nuclear transfer. Born in 1996, Dolly lived for six years, dying in 2002. Her body was donated to the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh, where she has become one of the museum's most popular exhibits. We finish this episode with the Highland Games, events held in the spring and summer in Scotland and in other countries as a way of celebrating Scottish and Celtic culture, especially the culture of the Scottish Highlands. Certain parts of the games are so well known that they've become Scottish icons, such as the bagpipes, the kilt, and the heavy events, the most famous being the caber toss. The Kowal Highland Gathering, better known as the Kowal Games, is held in Dunoon, Scotland every August. It is the largest Highland Games in Scotland, attracting around 3,500 competitors and somewhere in the region of 23,000 spectators from around the globe. Due to the Scottish diaspora, Highland Games can be found all over the world. Tiny Scotland is a massive piece of the global community puzzle. What did you learn and what did I miss? Also, what country would you like to see next? The plan is to start with five European nations, with the next being my fifth. We will be traveling to Asia over the next five, moving around the continents in groups of five. Be sure to let me know which country you would like to see in the comments. Until next time, folks, and thanks for joining us on our discovery of the global community.